I'm super excited. So I, uh, I asked Omid if he'd, he'd give a keynote talk about a bit about his uh, journey as an entrepreneur and, and company and uh, as an Austin startup. And I, I got to know Omid um, quite a while ago when you're really early had this crazy idea for this technology and just needed to prove it. You're like, you know, we need a university to show that this thing's work so, so people will, will believe, believe us. And, um, and it worked. And that journey has um, led to Yada Energy and uh, one of my favorite startups in, in Austin. And Omid's one of my, my favorite people to, who, I've, who I've gotten to know over the years. And I think they're doing some amazing things. Um, and I, I asked Omid if he'd come give a talk and tell us a little bit about his entrepreneurial journey, what Yada Energy does. Um, and I think it's really transformative product and business model. So really happy to have you here, Omid. Thanks, Brian. I did not know I was one of your favorite people. You are. It's good to know. We'll hang out some more now. Um, thanks everyone for being here. As Brian mentioned, my name is Omid. I'm the founder and CEO of Yada Energy. I, uh, before starting the company, I had no idea what startups were. I kind of just thought of this idea, started working on it with the co-founder, and little did I know what the heck I was getting myself into. So it's now been six years of uh, running the company and all facets of growth. And when I tell you we started in a garage without AC in Texas, um, to now we just moved into our brand new 40,000 square foot facility in Southeast Austin. So the company's growing, the market's growing. Um, the journey has been one of lots of ups and downs as any entrepreneurship journey will do to you. So I was hoping today kind of just to share a little bit about Yada Energy and kind of the market as it ties into Energy Week, and then share a little bit about the startup journey, and then just kick it over to the crowd and see what kind of questions you might have. And, uh, you know, kind of the atmosphere. So, I love solar energy. There's a lots of, form of forms of energy, but uh, there's none quite like solar. I like to joke and say that I eat, sleep, pray, think, dream, solar energy. So I asked the uh, ChatGBT to draw up this image for me. That's me taking a, a nice nap. One of the reasons, we tried really hard to actually get my face on there, but uh, really cool stuff. Um, one of the amazing things about solar, you know, there, there's lots of great forms of energy. There's wind, there's nuclear, geothermal, you know, hydrogen. But the really cool thing about solar energy that none of the other forms of energy can claim to have is the scalability and, and the decentralization of it, right? I could literally take a single solar panel with me camping and live off grid. You add two or three solar panels and it's, it's enough power for a modest home in lots, lots, of, lots of the world. You can put 20 of them together and you can power a home, 20 to 30. You put a couple of hundred or a thousand on a building, you're powering a building. You stack several thousand and you've got a utility scale power plant. And it literally can be the same technology, right? And a lot of folks don't know, but solar is the only form of energy generation that is not kinetic, I meaning it doesn't require something to move. When a windmill has a motor, um, every other form of generation requires a motor. Solar is really the only form of energy generation that is essentially solid state. And you could make a bed out of solar panels. You could, we have a couple of tables at our office made out of solar panels, so you could eat off of it. Um, and that's really what, what drew me into solar because I'm a big believer that, you know, new technologies aren't just enough for well-off industrialized countries. It has to make sense for the entire planet. And one of the reasons why I started the company is I did a lot of traveling before starting the company to a lot of nice places, exotic places, and I kind of felt guilty. Um, felt like I was traveling because I had the means to do it, and I was always going to these places that had a lot of energy poverty or just poverty in general, and which is, you know, it's great to travel, but then you kind of have this sense of guilt. And I said, well, if I can start a company that can scale globally, then I'd be traveling for a purpose. And what better 
purpose than, than that, to be taking new technology and new resources to new places. So I hope I explained why I love solar, and you should too. So how many of you guys know about energy demand? Um, I'm sure a lot of folks in this room. So electricity demand has been relatively fat, flat for the last 20 years. If you think about this, we have started using more electricity, but we've also gotten more efficient in our, current, our previous electricity usage. You have now LED bulbs that replace incandescents, which is a th almost a tenth of the energy usage. You have high efficiency appliances. You have heat pumps. But that's only going to get us so far, right? We're now entering the age of almost 2x increased demand for electricity. And we can prove this by a simple poll here in the room. So raise your hand if you currently drive an electric vehicle. Okay? Raise your hand if you plan to get an electric vehicle in the next 10 years. All right, that's way more than a 2x increase. That's almost a 10x increase, right? Um, raise your hand if you didn't, that if you live in an apartment and you had access to an overnight charger with your own parking spot, you would definitely be sold if getting an electric vehicle. So I think just about everyone in this room raised their hands, right? Um, and so where is that electricity going to come from? No one in their right man mind is going to go out and build a new coal power plant. Why? Because utility scale solar is a lot cheaper to generate. No one's going to go out and build a new nuclear power plant. And if they did, it takes at least 15, 20 years. Utility scale solar, while it's great, is backlogged. And then you have the issue of it becoming the same model as the, the historical grid, which is produce it somewhere, deliver it somewhere else, and all, all the losses associated. And then you have distributed generation, which is solar on homes and businesses, and parking lots, and, and even in community solar. So that segment of the market is going to be the fastest area to deploy new generation assets. So what's going to happen naturally? The price of electricity is going to go up. It already has. Most places in the country have seen almost a 50% rate increase just from a few years ago. And already in California, the cost of charging an electric vehicle has almost become the same as the cost of gasoline because the cost per kilowatt hour is between 30 and 40 cents. And so the, the, the reality is that the demand for the consumption of energy is, is outpacing the generation. But in the case of California also, we have issues with the intermediacy of renewables, right? We just aren't consuming all the power in the middle of the day when it's being produced, and we need it in the afternoons. And that's what our technology that you'll see kind of helps to solve. And so if you believe this, I think 2x is actually a very nominal increase to think about. Um, those who follow Elon, he says it's 2 to 3x increase in the electricity, the, in, the demand for energy, right? And that's not even including AI, right? AI is a wonderful technology. It's very exciting, um, but it consumes a lot of power. So those, those of us that are in you know, cryptocurrency, which kind of can be controversial because you're now taking a finite resource of the earth and making something that's supposed to be better for the planet but takes a lot of consumption of energy. But the point of all this is we're going to need a lot more energy. And the fastest way to create that energy is with distributed solar and also the cheapest, the, most, the least expensive. And that's proven. So solar is no longer like the feel-good put solar because I want to power my house with, with the sun. It is actually very quickly becoming the most economical way to make new generation. So, so that's great. Um, the CNI market, which is kind of the market that we focus on, stands for commercial industrial. It's anything that's not a single family home and not utility scale solar. So think of a multifamily apartment building, a Chipotle, all the way up to big Amazon warehouse, right? And currently in the US, the CNI market counts for 70% of energy consumption, which translates to about 30% of greenhouse gas emissions. And uh, only 4% of buildings in this industry today or sites have solar. And less than 0.1% of this has energy storage. And so if you've ever flown anywhere, you go into a city, you probably see a bunch of empty rooftops. 
and you're wondering why the heck aren't solar panels on there, right? And that's kind of what I did. That's kind of why we started the company and went into this market segment. So remember these numbers because I'm going to have a, a, a prize giveaway at the end who can remember the, uh, the percentages and facts. So our vision at Yada is to kind of transform this space and become a leading equipment technology provider for commercial buildings in the built environment. And kind of the, the, the topic of the talk today was the solar trifecta, because I really see it as a three-punch a three punch, punch approach. So just to kind of build even more of the demand for the market, right? As we know, as you guys prove, proved here today, there's going to be a, a huge increase in electric vehicles, which is going to increase energy storage, um, energy, solar energy storage. We're now getting to a point where the value of the kilowatt hour that it's produced changes. You literally have times that it goes negative, where you can get paid to consume energy, and you have times when it's four or five times the price. If, if you were looking at gasoline, imagine driving your car around to look for gas, and the price keeps fluctuating. It's literally what happens with electricity. And then you have states like California that have a high saturation of solar where they're literally having to dump clean electricity in the middle of the day. So now they've come out with programs called NEM 3.0. You can, starting 2024 onwards, you can put solar, but if you export to the grid, you get next to nothing. So it really quickly, overnight, created a demand for batteries. Because with batteries, you can store the energy and, and use it and offset the higher retail rates. And then the value, a lot of utilities are now starting to see that they can incentivize that the, these systems across various rooftops. So they're coming out with various programs to incentivize this. So if you own a building, you already get the tax credits that um, the previous gentleman was talking about. You get all those benefits, and then now you can actually get payments from the utility as well to use your rooftop to generate clean electricity. And that's not all of it. Like, if you really want to get believe in this market, then you have all of these companies that have, that have given these grandiose goals for ESG targets. We're going to power 80% you know, of our operations with renewable energy. And they're now realizing the only way they can hit those goals is to put solar panels on their rooftops. And so this market is primed for exponential growth. It's, uh, it's mind-boggling to think about the upcoming demand for energy and within a period of 10 years, you'll see that just about every rooftop space will have a system deployed. It just makes sense. You don't have to use any additional land, and it's the highest efficiency place to put it. So with all that being said, we wanted to solve the future problem, right? The problem with solar is that it's intermittent. You cannot control when it's produced. On April 8th, we're going to have a uh, solar eclipse. And literally, we're going to lose almost the entirety of the production, so much so that ERCOT has sent out a notice asking people to cut back on their power usage. Um, I think this last Monday, an interesting fact came out. 80% of our Texas grid was powered by renewables on Monday. 80%. And that's both wind and solar, but let's assume that solar was 30% of that. Imagine on Monday, April 8th, which is the day before my birthday, got blessed with a solar eclipse, um, that for a while, 30% of our energy is just going to drop down. Right? So it could become a huge problem. And so storage is the next evolution. It's, it's literally, we don't get the full benefits out of solar without solving storage. And that's what our company set out to do. And we tried to do something that was very different than what every other company was doing. Every other company was taking batteries and putting them in shipping containers and cabinets and thinking that we can just deploy a bunch of shipping containers around buildings. And we said, wait a second, no one's going to really want a bunch of shipping containers of batteries, and that's actually very dangerous. What if we use, create a decentralized distributed battery that can go on top of rooftops, the same way the solar panels go up? Sounds like a crazy idea. It was a crazy idea. It probably still is a crazy idea. Um, but that's where we developed the core, the core innovation behind Yada which is our very unique thermal management system. We utilize ceramics, uh, phase change material, and a very unique uh, thermal siphon that wicks away the heat. 
And the combination of these three technologies protects our batteries, even in the Texas heat. And we now have systems deployed all over the country, and we have live data to prove this. And very early on, we actually took a unit, we put it in a thermal chamber, and we took the hottest day on record in Phoenix, Arizona, and ran it five days in a row, just to prove that we could take the worst case scenario and prove our core thermal technology. And, you know, much through the kind of the learnings, we realized it wasn't enough just to build this battery. We needed to create the whole system, right? How does this battery interface with the utility grid? And we didn't want to be stuck in the cycle of having to integrate with all of these different power conversion companies out there. So again, we went to our customers, we did a lot of research, we said, okay, we need to create the full solution. So this is essentially a snapshot of the Yada solution. You have the solar panel, the solar panel feeds the battery, the battery through the gateway can either charge or bypass, and then it goes into the inverter. And we have pioneered commercial microinverters for the CNI space, and what comes out of this inverter is either 480 three-phase power, which directly ties into the utility, or 208 three-phase power, which goes through the building's transformers. So we literally have a system that is distributed, decentralized, and just dispatches power into the utility grid. And now I get to the third part. Well, what is the solar trifecta, right? As we talked about, electric vehicles will undoubtedly create a higher demand for electricity. Prices will go up. A lot of the naysayers will say, you know, electric vehicles don't make sense. It costs way too much to charge. And that's why this has to become a trifecta. It's not enough just to produce the solar and the power conversion or the energy storage. It has to tie in with EV charging. And that's the next frontier of our company, is creating a comprehensive system that brings all three of these technologies together so that as a building owner, you can say, great, I want 20 electric vehicle chargers added to my building. And someone who's savvy enough will come and say, well, you know, sir, your demand charges are going to 3x. And so the savings you might have from the electric cars are going to be washed away by the increased demand charges that the utility is going to charge on your bill. But there's a way around that, and that's the Yada's technology. Put solar and batteries in the rooftop, and you now can dispatch the batteries when you're charging the cars. And uh, those of you who know a lot about electricity, utilities, as more and more buildings put solar, they're going to shift their revenues and their profits onto demand charges. What are they charging you for the potential demand that you might need in any, in any instant moment? And so, you know, we, we, and then this goes even further, we can talk about, you know, where it really goes to, where software and load control, but at the very basis, this is a snapshot of the Yada system. We've pioneered a very unique battery system. It's, it's so simple that I could teach you guys probably for five minutes and everyone in here can get on a rooftop and install this energy storage system. And it is, it is extremely safe because we're completely low voltage. We never get into high voltage DC. And that's one of the huge benefits of our systems. Um, some of you may have seen fires that happened on solar rooftops on Walmarts. This happens because of high voltage DC. And our system architecture basically eliminates this risk. There is no risk of having an arcing event. And it doesn't stop there. So through customers, one of the things you'll learn in the, in the uh, entrepreneurship journey is the customer is going to pull you to different directions. And we've had a lot of requests to install the batteries into carports because not every building is perfect for rooftop solar. Or sometimes, you know, customers want more demand for energy. So Walmart, for example, is putting these carports almost in stores across the, across the nation right now. And so we are also integrating our battery into carports to support DC fast charging, right? which is, again, a, another huge um, market opportunity. In fact, France announced last year that they're mandating you cannot build a new parking lot without a solar carport, which is kind of crazy but, um, and to think that. But it just, it just makes sense. So sometimes governments have to put these policies. They kind of have to move the market in a, in a certain direction. So to think of Yada's solution, again, it, it, you know, we, we, we live and dream and breathe this every day. And, you know, 
But the core, the fundamental question we get is, why the heck would you put batteries on a rooftop? And uh, you won't really know the answer until you've installed the competitor's batteries and have to go through all of this list of items that you see underneath the iceberg. But this simple graphic really explains it well. You know, when you do a centralized traditional energy storage system, you've got to think of all of these costs, where to put the batteries, building, building the, uh, you know, the independent pads, the fire suppression system, the real estate. You know, sometimes when you're taking up parking spots, you actually have to change the occupancy permits of that building to do so. Um, we've had customers that, because of our architecture, they can save almost a million dollars on the entire system because they can avoid electrical upgrades because we're kind of a solar and storage within the same process. And yeah, so I hope I gave some good color of, of, of Yada and the potential that, that lies ahead of us. Certainly, if you were here for the previous talk on the IRA incentives, it's an amazing time to be in this industry. Um, the IRA brings 10 years of stability to this marketplace, um, and we're going to need it because we will have shortages of energy. I think those of us that maybe studied history or are old enough know that there could be an oil crisis with energy. You know, there could be a, a uh, energy crisis with electricity. So, Mitch, I didn't mean to look at you when I said that. Um, so, I want to uh, shift over now and just kind of talk about the entrepreneurial journey, right? And answer any questions you might have, because this is a university. Um, this technology didn't come from UT, but we've had a lot of support from the University of Texas. We were a very early company in Austin Technology Incubator, which is a UT-sponsored incubator. And uh, it was very critical for us in getting set up in the early days um, on building the company. So, how many of you in here think about starting your own company one day? Raise your hand. Just one person? Two people? Three? It's not easy. It is not easy. Um, Mitch knows that. He's probably seen a lot of companies come and go and a lot of crazy, crazy founders. So, so I wanted to open up the questions because you know, prior to starting the company, I had no idea what it was like to start a company. Um, one of the things I think were, were, that were my core strengths is my ability to learn new things very quickly. And if I could summarize what a founder needs to be successful, it is the ability to learn and adapt very quickly, persistence, you know, just not giving up and not taking no for an answer, and really a deep, deep passion for the problem that you're solving. If I didn't love solar the way I love solar, I probably would have given up at many points. So if you're going to start a company, make sure it's something you're going to do regardless of what you get paid to do it, regardless of how difficult it becomes, because all of these big successful companies that we see, you guys have seen, the, the some of you may have seen the famous quote from the founder of NVIDIA where he's asked you know, if he would do this again, and he's like, no, I wouldn't do it. If I knew how hard this would be, I would have been a fool to do this again. Right? So, um, so, so that's my number one advice. Yes. So Amid, we got, one, we got a question here. So I think we have time for one question. So. Hi, my name is Rob. Thank you very much for speaking to us today. Um, with your entrepreneurial journey, how did you find the mentors and people to surround you um, that really helped to uplift you? And then second part, did you, have you had any bad experiences of giving away equity um, too quickly? That seems to be kind of a classic problem in your journey. Um, so I'm intrigued to hear about either. Thank you. Yeah, actually, we're, um, that's a great question. I was chatting with another founder uh, the other day who's also part of the, you know, this Energy Week. And you're going to get a lot of offers for a lot of advisors early on. Right? And then you might get in a cycle of all you're doing is appeasing the advisors, and it's not really helping you. Right? I think you know, when you're starting a company, um, you know, only take advisors that are actually useful for you and challenge them. They have to be producing. They almost have to see them as employees. And then you have to be bold. If someone's not working out and they have some sort of equity structure, you know, a lot of times you're like, I don't want to burn that bridge. I've kind of 
promised them. There were a few advisors that I just, I let go and just let them fest because I didn't want to burn the bridge. But advisors have to be useful for you. But I think the most important thing is find people that have actually done something similar to what you're doing. If your advisor has never done anything like this, they're probably not giving you the best advice. Um, so if I were you, I'd try to find a founder who's been at it, who's raised capital, you know, to be a mentor because they actually can give you advice that's relevant. So not all advice is great advice, and that's one thing you're going to have to learn. So how about the giving away too much equity and, fun, you know, funding rounds and all that? How do, how do you manage that? <laughs> yeah, well, that's, that's part of the journey. Again, that's why I say you have to be passionate about what you're doing because I, uh, you know, very early on, we raised capital, but we probably didn't raise the valuations that we wanted to. So I have given up a lot of equity, whether it's to advisors or investors. But at the end of the day, I, don't, I think you'll find that most companies that become big companies, the founders aren't driven by the idea of becoming rich. They're driven by the idea of taking to market what they're trying to do or solving the problem for humanity. And then through that course, they end up becoming rich, right? And if you're a founder that's trying to start a company just to get rich, it's very easy to spot that out. Um, and some of them do that, and, they, and they're successful, and there's no, there's no harm in that, right? But if you really want to build something that's valuable, you're not in it for the money. You're in it for the impact that you're making. So. Awesome. Do we have Thanks time for so. one more question? Yeah. Um, Anybody else? Yes, I got stuff to give away. That's why. Oh, I'm... yeah. Go, go, go for it. Yeah. Well, I've got quite a bit of stuff. So how many of you remember... How much the electricity might increase in demand? Yes. Uh, Just make a number up. <laughs> What's that? Oh, uh, two times. At least two times. At least two times. You can come pick a hat or a shirt instead of throwing it. Um, the CNI market stands for what? Commercial industrial. Here you go. I've always wanted to throw shirts, so. <laughs> what, a, what percentage of the greenhouse gas emissions does the CNI market account for? 70%. 70 so percent was the energy consumption. 30, there we go. And you can trade swag if you want. Oh, oh, oh. I'll give you one for participation. <laughs> oh. All right, last but not least, uh, name one of the components in Yada's technology in the battery. That's part of our integration, but someone said ceramics? Yeah. Ceramic. All right, you can come get a shirt. I can't throw that far. I've got a good arm. All right, well, thank you guys so much. Hopefully I, I gave you a bit of knowledge. And thanks, Omid. Thanks for hearing me out.